So we are going to co-preach. I'm doing the beginning part, and then Janie is going to do most of the second part. And some of you here have not met Janie Spar before. And so I want to just do like 30 seconds of introduction, which is impossible to do. But for the purposes especially of our sermon this morning, Janie is the former executive director of That All May Freely Serve, which was a very important organization in the life of the Presbyterian Church USA that was all about um, what we would call sharing the good news of all the queer people in the church with the church. Um, uh, and that was in addition to More Light and also the Covenant Network of Presbyterians. But what's really important for you to know is that Janie has been a dear friend of this congregation for decades and decades and is probably one of the primary reasons I've been the pastor here for the last 11 years. Yes. Janie was the one who kept bugging me, and I, I use that word intentionally, and saying, I just really think you should look at this church, when I was saying, no, no way am I looking. I just really think. So anyway, um, there's lots more to say, but that's probably enough for the purposes of um, what we're going to be doing in a minute. On Wednesday night, I attended a 19th District Council special meeting on race and policing with Marianne and with Peggy Long from this con congregation. One of the people who spoke at the meeting was a retired black female Chicago Police Department officer named Elise. She told us a story that is about nonviolence, even though she didn't use those words. She said in the aftermath of the murder of George Floyd, she was in the middle of mentoring a group of young people who want to be police officers when she got the command to go downstairs and outside and stand with the officers facing a group of protesters. After putting on her tactical gear and her helmet, she went down and said there was a huge crowd and at the front, were a very vocal and angry group of young people who were yelling at police officers and looking up their star numbers one by one and then yelling out all the complaints under that officer's number. Elise described her conflicted feelings. On the one hand, she was so proud of the young people for using their voices and standing up for what they believe in. On the other hand, she was an officer and their anger was being directed at her and her colleagues. She said there was a white male lieutenant there who was getting more of the crowd's anger, and there was a point where she noticed that he looked like he was about to lose it. We who were listening to her understood that to mean he was about to use violence. Elise went up behind him, pulled on his vest, and told him she was going to stand in front of him. And she did just that. The young people moved along down the line and continued yelling out star numbers and numbers of complaints. And Elise stood her ground, standing in the gap for the lieutenant who had had enough. After a couple of hours, the crowd left that location and went elsewhere to continue the protest. By paying attention, noticing where violence was likely, and by her willingness to stand in the gap at great risk to herself, Elise prevented violence by one person against another that could have turned into hundreds of injuries and even deaths, given that one side of the conflict had guns and most of the other side did not. She definitely lived into our first principle of nonviolence, Nonviolence is a way of life for courageous people. Elise explained to the group gathered on Wednesday night that one of the reasons she was able to do that was that when she looked at the angry crowd of young people, she saw her son. She realized they were young people who didn't feel heard, who were tired of police abuse, who simply wanted to be able to live without always being profiled by police. 
She told us, I saw them as humans, and that makes all the difference. You are much less likely to hurt people if you see them as your family or your friends or your neighbors or your community members. She was highlighting what we talked about last week with our second principle of nonviolence. Nonviolence seeks to win friendship and understanding. While she did not try to become friends with the angry crowd gathered, she did try to understand what was pushing them to behave like they were, and she could let go of needing to exhibit power over them in any way. She told us that's how she was during her entire 24 years on the force. She referred to herself as officer friendly and said that when the angry crowd was reading off the complaints against each officer one by one, when they got to her, they saw there were no complaints. In 24 years on the job, she never had one person file a complaint against her. Our third principle of nonviolence is nonviolence seeks to defeat injustice or evil, not people. This one is difficult and is important. The idea is that when we identify people as the problem, we forget they are also victims of the evil systems we all live with. Similar to last week's principle of seeking friendship and understanding, Part of what undergirds this third principle of defeating or attacking evil in systems rather than individuals is at the end of the day, all of us individuals need to find ways to live together. If we humiliate someone or cancel them or ostracize them or defeat them, we are not seeking reconciliation and the building of the beloved community. Instead, we're simply retaliating or getting revenge or tearing down the beloved community. We are hating our enemies instead of loving them. After describing one careful distinction, we're gonna pivot and Janie and I are gonna bring this principle alive using the example of the struggle for inclusion for queer people in the Presbyterian Church USA. So there's one careful distinction we want to make. While this third principle of nonviolence means we don't want to attack an individual, it does not mean that we cannot speak the truth about an individual or speak truth to an individual. For the past eight years, I've repeatedly challenged us to refrain from name calling or using demeaning terms for Trump. Calling him names is demeaning and demoralizing and accomplishes nothing. That does not mean we cannot speak the truth about his actions or his policies or his convictions or about his involvement in Project 2025. Calling him names is attacking him as an individual when we know full well there is a massive effort and system of Christian white nationalists behind him that are responsible for funding him and pushing his behavior. As seekers of justice, we work to defeat politicians who are not leading well or who are harming those they claim to be serving. Defeating a politician can also happen without attacking only the individual. I'm gonna stop there. And that leads us right into the Presbyterian Church USA as we go deeper into understanding why we don't seek to defeat individuals, but instead focus on defeating the evil and harmful systems. Janie has been involved in the struggle for queer inclusion for decades and decades and was involved for at least two decades before I ever got involved. As I entered in, I remember being shocked by how nice our side was compared to the other side. Janie was my primary mentor, though I had others as well, like Lisa Largis 
and Jim and Jackie Sparr and Cal Chin and Sarah Taylor, Scott Clark, Ray Bagnolo, and Jimmy Rigby. Without referring to Dr. King's principles of nonviolence directly, when they would talk about strategy, and again, this is as I was entering in, they would talk about the very things we've been talking about, the need to be courageous, the need to seek friendship and understanding, needing to love our enemies, needing to focus on policies and not people. A constant refrain was, let's show them how incredible our people really are. Before Michelle Obama was saying, when they go low, we go high, it's exactly what the queer movement was doing. I watched debate after debate when the other side would tear down specific individuals. Anytime someone from our side stood up, they would speak of the injustice and the mistreatment, and sometimes you'd never even hear a name evoked unless speaking about factual things. Janie, I want us to start by asking you to describe what happened at the 1978 General Assembly that speaks to how our queer trailblazers in the church really embodied nonviolence. So let me say first, howdy do, Lincoln Park. <laughs> um, I want to say that in this movement, just before we start, that you were a starship in this movement. And mm. this church was filled with those of us who believed that there was a faith community that really cared who we are. And so I really say you were right in the forefront of all this. Many of our strategy meetings happened right here at Lincoln Park. So I just want you to know, so that every time I come to Lincoln Park, I see and witness so many people who were here um, who helped make this particular movement real and uh, move forward. So I'll say in the 1978 assembly, I went there with a youth group and stayed on the floor of a church as and I couldn't do that now, but certainly it was an amazing time. And so we went to the 1978 assembly. We had met Chris Glasser, who had told his story, and he's a wonderful gay man, and so we thought, oh, this is going to be fun, you know, for the kids. And so we went there, and we heard vilifying, terrible things said about LGBTQ people. It was so demoralizing. Mm. And this is what I saw. Sandy Broaders was the head of the was was the seminary intern from Princeton at the committee that was studying who we are. And it was, shall we ordain people that are ready to be ordained? And Bill Silver was ready to be ordained out of New York City Presbytery. And she at the end of the committee meeting said, I know essentially that what we're doing here is that we are essentially saying that no, we will not ordain LGBT people. And she said, but I want you to know that I am one of those people. And the assembly was hushed. And the assembly then, afterward, her life was threatened. She was, the scholarship that she had to Princeton Theological Seminary was taken away and no one would sit with her at the seminary for fear that they would be seen as complicit with her. So I want you to know what happened at that assembly. But at that assembly, this is what I saw. Sandy, David Sint out of this church, Chris Glasser and Bill Silver, at night as the delegates were coming out of the meetings, we were singing to them. We had candles and we were loving them. And we had the candles by our faces so they could see us, so that they could see these were the people they were saying no to. And then at lunchtime, we had this time of when we were naming and praying for all 600 delegates. You should know by the end of that assembly, there were 50 votes, but it was how I watched this with such care 
And after my former husband, Jimmy, he came up to me and he said, oh, Janie, let's just get out of here. And I said, no, no, we're to go across the street. And we went honestly down into this hotel and it was like we went into the catacombs <laughs> and we opened the door and there was Roger Wilson leading us in song and people were singing and smiling and saying, here we go and we're on to this movement and there was no thing of moroseness or anything. It was like, they're going to know who we are. And of course we thought we would, because we were so wonderful, of course we thought that they'd just love us the next year and vote for us, but how did we know it would be 30 years? But, but it was this amazing time. And I remember going home, Jimmy and I kind of went out of there and he said, well, I know what we're gonna do. He said, we're going to start a movement in California. And we really did. We started uh, Presbyterians for Lesbian Gay Concerns in California. It was one of these things where we were uplifted in watching this justice approach of, even though they were telling us, I mean, you can't believe the things people were saying about us, but it was like, oh, you don't know who we are. We're, we're your children. We're your grandchildren. You don't know who we are, so we're going to let you know who we are. Mm. So that was that assembly. Do you That's want me big. to say? So, do, so we're going to talk about a couple other assemblies that okay. have been very important. Okay. And also, one of the things um, that I would love for you to describe, you just said it took 30 years. Even though the assemblies were very important, especially at particular times, there was a lot that happened in between assemblies, a right. lot of educating. So can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I can talk about, you know, after a while they got kind of sick of seeing, you know, Martha and Tammy who were out and they were sick of being told that they were, be that it was bestiality to love one another. I mean, it was this kind of thing. And so several of us were out then across the country beginning to, to really speak out so that people had to look at us and not like us, do you know? But what happened is, because these were such really nice people, they liked us and didn't know what to do with us. And what it did, it brought an authenticity. So when we would tell our stories, it was just quite remarkable. So we had van trips across the country. And what we learned is this, when you go into the South, you have to take Southerners with you. So we always had allies that were with us, and then we always had Southern people on the end. So one would be Southern with this great accent, and one would end with a great accent, and they would say things like this. Well, I love you, honey, but you're a Yankee. But they couldn't say that because there were these fabulous Southerners telling their story. So we went into Birmingham, Alabama. I'll just tell this. We went into Birmingham, and. It was so incredible. We, we went in this van, and then we would come out of the van, and we went to this one church, and we watched these. We knew everybody in the room who was lesbian or gay at that time. It was lesbian and gay. And we would go there, and we would say things like this. It is good to be who you are. As a matter of faith, it is good. And I'm telling you, their little faces, they would just hit the table and weep. You knew everyone because no one had ever told them that they were good and that God loved them. We did this everywhere around the country and it was just, you just can't believe what it did. And then when people stop, would hear stop hearing individuals, it was Martha Jullerette who called me on the phone and said, Janie, Tammy and I just can't hear this one more time, how terrible we are. She said, I'm gonna lay aside my ordination and I'm going to lay aside some stoles. So she said, I want to come out to your place in California, and I want to go with you to the quilt. And I want to see how they take care of the quilts. The AIDS quilt. The right? AIDS quilt. The mm -hmm. AIDS quilt. And there were thousands of AIDS quilts. So we went into San Francisco and met with the people. And I could watch Martha as she watched how they take care of the AIDS quilt and so on. And then how would we begin to take care of stoles and tell the story of people? So what happened is when you have stoles, which we did, all around this church and so many churches across the country, you got to read the story of people who never named who they were 
but it was their story of what it was like to be in a choir, what it was like to be a deacon, what it was like to be an elder, what it was like to be a pastor, and not say who you are. And there were hundreds and hundreds of stoles, so that how we educated the church was going out into these van trips, into these places. And then we would have times when people would just say terrible things and our allies then, like Jim, Jim Rigby would say to me, you know, when someone said, I'm a psychologist and you're all, you know, terrible people and, you know, it's just a phase, all the things that they used to say. And Jim, Jim Rigby would say, I'd like to take that question. And then he, if any of you knew this man, he was from Texas, and he knew the Bible better than anybody, and then he knew psychology better than anybody, but he did it in such a loving way, you know, that essentially trounced the man but loved him, you know? <laughs> it was amazing to watch. So we did all that, and then the Stroll Project, where people were afraid to meet people or didn't think they know people, they could read the Stoles. And that was another way, another strategy that we did. Yeah. Do you want me to speak about the 1991? Yeah. So another way that we did it, because we attended every assembly, and there's nothing like cheery gay people. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you know, I mean, honest to God, we were loving these people, and they were hating us, but we were just so cheery. And, and, and so, so the one assembly we wore, after that we knew we couldn't because of how you take care of them, but we wore some of these stools, and you could see people coming up to us. It was just extraordinary. And in 1991, we always met with the moderator of the church who, who liked us or didn't, and this moderator did. And so we... My twin sister and her husband went out to a um, huge lumber yard, and we made this cross. I'm talking, it was a huge cross, and even trying to get it into the hotel through revolving doors was a story <laughs> in itself. But what happened is, this cross, Jenny Davidson was there, Peg, but Lisa Bove, all these things. But as we put this cross together, now I'm gonna tell you this story that is, it's a naughty thing, but it's so, so the thing is you, you had to make it real for people. Yeah. So that as we brought this cross forward to, there was a time when you laid it on the floor and then you pounded the nails. Now, there were several lesbians who were teaching gay men how to use a hammer. <laughs> and there were times, pardon me, where you would hear someone would hit the nail but hit themselves and you'd hear, oh shit, or something like that, you know, kind of thing. So we practiced a long time about this. So we were able to, lesbians came in, able to take our turns doing that. But it, I just can't even begin to tell you the practice. But, but as we went forward, you could, the assembly and the delegates, and he allowed us to walk through the delegates. And as we walked forward, you began to hear crying. And it was all done silently. And we walked forward with this cross and people behind us who were lesbian and gay, and you began to feel this sacred moment and out of the delegates poured hundreds of delegates came forward with us and then we turned and we sang to them. Mm. And I can't even begin to tell you what that moment was like. And there were several moderators who wanted to walk with us but they were afraid to. And it was Jenny Davidson, former vice moderator, of the General Assembly who walked in front with this cross. And those moments did more mm -hmm. to say, oh my God, what are we doing? And it brought more allies, brought more people from their seats. So the vote in 1991 was not what it was you know, 50 and 78, and you just see a movement. And in between is this strategy of loving people through their fear, personing the issue, doing this across the country. And then as we matured more as a movement, 
you had more light, you had that all may freely serve, and you had the shower of stools. And what we did, we called ourselves the Three Sisters. And we became very powerful of witnessing in all these different ways. So that, that, that was really an important assembly. Yeah. And then one more, stay with me, are you here? Yeah. yeah. So um, in 2000, we asked Mel White, who wrote the book, Stranger at the Gate, who, was, who had come out of very conservative theology and had come out as gay. And it had made people very, very upset, especially those who were on the far right, uh, uh, Christians. And so at the assembly, what he did, he trained us all. And we did his organization called Soul, Soul Force. And we stood as people came into the assembly. We locked our arms and we had signs, very loving signs, and we said nothing. And a lot of these people that we knew, and we just stood there together in a big circle and just held on to one another. Mm. On the other side, across from us, there were people yelling terrible epithets about us, about how terrible we were. You just can't imagine what they were saying. And we were, the contrast we seeing, seeing this hate coming out and then us just standing there in total silence, looking at people, loving people, and all of a sudden you had more and more people coming to stand with us and weeping with us. And it was there then that we were arrested for being, what would you say? Civil disobedience. Civil, civil disobedience, there we were. And Jenny Davidson was in her 80s, and we, I was preparing her, and she said, Janie, I have never taken my wedding ring off in all these years, but I guess I'll take that off, and I'll take off all my things, and so on. She said, because I've never been arrested before. And I said, well, good for you. This is your chance. <laughs> and she was so wonderful. And Bill Thompson, who in 1978 had been the clerk of this whole assembly who had done this thing about ordination, he came. And he was in his 80s, and we all locked arms. And they took us away and arrested us, and it was this moment of people who then by then knew us saying, oh my God, what, what have we done? What have we done to these really loving people? So it's again this strategy of nonviolence, which the contrast between these epitaphs being hurled at us in committee meetings and all this kind of thing, and us standing, loving the people. And then we had people like Howard Warren, who used to stand outside with all his buttons and so on, and he was, he was like John the Baptist, you know. It was these wonderful ways of letting people know, this is who you're hurting. You're hurting people who you know and love. So, yeah. yeah. So, and a couple things that are worth highlighting, I think, about that is um, in any kind of act of civil disobedience, there is a lot of training that goes into yeah. how you're going to be in that action and preparing people well enough so that people can make a choice in advance of, I'm willing to get arrested, I'm not willing to get arrested. Right. And some people, based on trauma and life things, and Right. would have to say, I can't get arrested. And other people could say, I can get arrested. Right. And so I think that's an important highlight that is still happening in movements today. Right. And then there were also a lot of people who um, could not do what Howard Warren was doing. Right. They had been hurt in a particular way, in such a way, they might be able to work for policy behind the scenes, right. but they could not be the person at the door greeting people in love. Right. And I think, you know, one of the things that's always made for the success is people get to say, I'm able to do this, I'm not mm -hmm. able to do this. And often it would change, right, depending on that's right. where people were in their lives. Right. And they changed all along. Yeah. I mean, we all changed. And one of the things we've really said, this is the thing, because you had people then that were closeted and yeah. those of us that were out. 
And this is what we said. We are not angry at the people who cannot come out. We are angry at a system that invites our people to lie about who we are. Yeah. And as long as you knew you were fighting a system, then you knew that you wouldn't go in on each other, which that's part of the system, is to get people against each other. We were very yeah. together as a people, and I think that was another thing. That's that was, huge. That was huge. Yeah. And again, um, but this traveling then around the country, I wanted to say there were places where people would yell, you know, like, I hate you. You know, I hate you for making me think about these things. And you say, thank you so much. You know, next question. Or in the <laughs> South, I always had this one thing in the South. Well, Reverend Spar, we don't even talk about heterosexuality, let alone homosexuality. And then they'd say, but we're going to talk about it now. I say, yes, we are. But it's these wonderful moments in which people wanted to tell us about their grandchildren and their children. One woman in Iowa, a grandmother, was there and she would say, she said to me, I've been waiting for you to come a long time because I got a granddaughter and I just love her to pieces and she's a lesbian and I want to tell you I love her. And I'm telling all my congregation, or you'd go into these congregations and you knew the people, well, you thought you did, at least that were gay, that you thought they might be. And then they'd say things like this, well, you all are gonna leave and what are we gonna do? And I'm telling you, they would stand. Someone in their congregation who they loved or was a deacon, they would stand and say, well, I've waited to tell you, and I'm a lesbian, I'm gay. And you could see the people say, Sally, our Sally. Do you know, it was these moments in which people had the opportunity to, to say, I'm here, and I'm in your church, and I've been here with you yeah. all this time. So it was a whole strategy yeah of helping people either, you know, be who they are. So we were working with our own people, but we were also working with then indignant parents. Then parents, remember parents and friends of lesbians and gays? I mean, all of this, it was like, I've heard enough. And I, we heard that all around the country. Yeah. So say, so we have to wrap up soonish. Yes. Um, but say something about all of the trials that happened, and, and there's trials within the church, so they don't go to civil courts, but we have courts within the Presbyterian church system. And many of our queer beloveds yeah. um, were brought up on charges for violating the, the Book of Discipline, the Book of Order in the Presbyterian church. So say something about the role that the trials played in nonviolent resistance? Well, it was um, when the church said no, if you had a remedial case, that would be against a presbytery for ordaining someone or something. So the person never had a chance to speak, usually. But in a disciplinary case, you could say anything about the church. And we brought also great allies who knew the Presbyterian church law and knew how much how the history of this conscientious objector kind of thing, that it's a matter of conscience. So we had all this history that we were retraining Presbyterians about, which was just marvelous. And then we had this, well, these trials, what they did is again, they, they named people like Beth and they named people like Lisa Lart. I mean, they named people that, that were amazing people and then you could see the people around them be so upset that they were the ones that were being charged. So in a way, the trials gave us fodder for freedom. Mm -hmm. They were the fodder in which we educated people. And then we traveled the country again with all these trials that were happening. And we were able to be with people so that the church was able to see us in all different ways. So the trials became actually a thing that really helped us change people's hearts and minds. Well, and, and one of the things that happened along the way in the trials is that um, eventually we requested that whoever was bringing the case against a person would be named. 
And so again, not about defeating that person, but you can speak truth to power in terms of it's okay to name um, what's being done in the way of harm. And so, you know, eventually people who were trying to be very anonymous had their names read out loud at a trial. And that made some difference. You know, people began to see, oh, one person is bringing cases against 20 people. And, and then you begin to see where the justice issue really is. And, and I will say, you know, some of us in, in terms of trials um, or in, in terms of investigations, because I was investigated, and, um, and I asked the committee that they bring in my accuser so that we could have a face-to-face -face conversation. And accusers never want to have to have a face-to-face -face conversation. And so we took their strategy and just turned it right upside down, and, um, and they did not like it. And it was very effective, because then these investigating committees would hear the horrible things coming from this side in the midst of this one-on-one, -on -one, you know, this meeting, this face-to-face -face meeting, and then hear what we were saying, which were not horrible things. And so a lot of investigating committees would then say, oh, we're, you know, we're not going any further with this. It's clear who's at fault here, right? So again, kind of taking the strategy and yeah. flipping it right over. And I think the thing is, the person who had done the complaint against me never came to any of it. Yeah. And so I called him on the phone and I said, where were you? Yeah. Where were you? that you didn't come and hear all these couples and their testimony. Where were you because I am doing your cleanup work? We lost this case and where were you? He was so stunned that I had called him. It was like, why didn't you talk to me before? Why didn't you ask me why I married these people? Why didn't you ask me who they are to me and, all, and you could hear him on the other phone. It was almost like he didn't understand what he had done and how he had hurt so many people. So it was like, don't mess with us anymore, darling, you know, yeah. kind of thing. And it wasn't that I was angry with him. I was telling him the truth. This is what happens, and you didn't even come. Yeah to the trial, yeah. it's something, so. Which, which is a powerful aspect of this because it's not about not holding people accountable. Right. It's about maintaining your own sense of self in the midst of really difficult struggles. And that's what we're talking about with these principles of nonviolence. It's the, they do not get to make you Right. who you are. Yeah. You get to continue to be your amazing self in the face of no matter what they do, right? That's right. And in systems, it's about systems yeah. that we are challenging. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes the system is the church. And that's okay. Yeah. Because we believe that Jesus was with us. No, I mean, you know, but it's, <laughs> it's, it was like, how can, the, how can they not see us, right? Yeah. And so they finally did. Yeah. So, and it's a powerful word for what we're going through right now. Yes. Uh, no matter which side you come at it from, how can we see people who are saying something very different from what we're saying? And that's really what we're talking about. So that, uh, one more story, yeah. because there's, at no, the no, General no. Assembly, uh, not, at, at one of the trials, this man came up to me just before I went in, and he said, Janie Spar, if you win, today, I'm taking five churches with me. Out of the church. Out of, out of, these, out of the, the church. We're going out of the denomination. And I said, well, well, first of all, I don't know who you are, sir. And we had this thing. And I said, you know what? Whatever happens here, I wonder if we could meet afterward and we could just be together. And all these people behind me say, don't meet with them. <laughs> you know, kind of but what happened was we went in this room and we I said to him, sir, you think it's a sin, and I think it's a gift. So here we are. So who's your family? Tell me about yourself. 
And then I told him about my family, and we had this thing. And then we prayed together. It was just this most wonderful thing. And he said to me after both J.D. Spar, I don't know anything about this gay and lesbian thing, but by God, I think you're a Christian. You know, he was just annoyed. But so when we went to South Carolina to this church with all our, we went on a van trip. We went to South Carolina, and people were told not to come to meet us. And you know who came to meet us? He came to meet us, the man who had prayed with me. And this is what he said, I am so ashamed because they should be here today and hear and see who I'm meeting. So a lot happens in this not making someone another. But here we are. And I know you disagree with me, but by God, we're going to find one another. And he was the only one that came to that meeting. It was incredible. incredible. And then he said, and I'm going back and tell him how I feel about all this. So, wow. So it's learn a lot. Yeah. Is, is that a good place to end? Shall we end? Yeah. Look, shall Amen. We? Amen. All right.